because we have Lauren on, and she's so controversial. Loren. Loren. <laughs> Sorry. Just remember Sophia Loren. Okay. But I don't have those big boobs. Loren Murray is an independent scientist. She has, she has been on a crusade against nuclear weapons for over a decade after visiting the peace museums at Hiroshima and Nagasaki, which changed her life. She was a geoscientist investigating nuke plants when they have problems and worked at Lawrence Livermore National Labs. She is a meticulous data researcher and has worked with some of the brightest minds on researching the connection between radiation and health effects. And we are honored to have her on the program today. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Christina. I'm really, really, really pleased to be on your program. And um, I want to thank your audience also for listening. I watched an interview that you did on Exopolitics three weeks after Fukushima happened, and everything that you predicted on that program has come true. And you said at the time you had called for immediate encasement of the reactors as well as spraying cement on the trees and on the ground around the plant to prevent contamination from spreading. Is there anything that can be done expeditiously at this point? Are, there, are these still viable options, or is it too late? Well... They just um, denied and delayed, and uh, they created a much, much, much worse situation. And uh, there is nothing that can be done now except what uh, the Russian advisors, the French advisors, and the American advisors told them right after Fukushima happened. And they said, you need to... Uh, uh, put bombs around the um, the plant and blow the entire uh, platform that those nuclear reactors are sitting on into the ocean, and that would have uh, stopped the that would have been uh, a big cooling event to uh, prevent the escape and the release of the huge amounts of radiation that have um, escaped from the plant. And um, that's what other governments recommended, and the Japanese did the opposite and just made the, the situation, um, it's now a, a, a global disaster. You've said that chronic exposure to low-level radiation is the worst form of nuclear war. And in one of your interviews, you actually reference an article that was published in several newspapers in 1947 saying the most efficient way to have a nuclear war is to explode a bomb in storm clouds and have it rain down on the population. That's exactly what they're doing with Fukushima. The releases are 24 hours a day into the lower part of the atmosphere it's called the troposphere and the troposphere is the most dynamic part of the atmosphere it's where all the storms and the rain and the hurricanes and tornadoes and convective mixing of the air occurs and so um when this radiation floats up into these lower levels of the atmosphere uh at at every tiny increment of the of altitude, the winds are carrying it in different directions. So um, it isn't until you get up into the hot, the, the high, high, high troposphere that you get into the jet stream. So the main distribution is not the jet stream. That's incorrect. It's going in every direction in the lower part of the troposphere, and the disaster is that 95% of that radiation is rained out in two and a half months. It's an acute nuclear war, much worse than atmospheric testing, because the atmospheric bomb tests injected the radiation very, very high into the atmosphere, above the troposphere. And, um, and they were actually doing that to study the ionosphere and the Earth's magnetic field, the Van Allen belts, and so forth, to uh, develop the greatest weapon system ever developed in, in, in on the history of this planet, and that is HARP. And um, they didn't know anything about the ionosphere, so they had to inject radioactive particles up into the uh, magnetic 
field lines and observe their behavior in order to understand how the ionosphere worked. And um, so this uh, 85% of the radiation released from nuclear bomb tests is still up there. So we're getting a very, very acute nuclear war uh, for over a year since March 11th, 2011, when Fukushima happened. And it's actually increased um, <coughs> uh, since the uh, middle or the end of July. And that's when the, the melted fuel that dripped out of the reactors, uh, even on the first day within 24 hours, that has reached the, that reached the groundwater. Uh, it was about 20 or 30 feet down. It just melted right down through the, the soil and rocks. And um, that's where it is now. And it's extremely dangerous because if that hot fuel hits a pocket of water in, the, in a fault zone, it will um, expand into steam, which can explode like Chernobyl did. You know, if to put this in a little more perspective, if Fukushima was stopped today, how long would it take for a complete rain out of all the radiation in our air? It would take years? Um, well, that's a really hard question to answer because uh, the radiation is not just in the troposphere now, it's even higher in the stratosphere. And um, it could even be in lower orbital space. Um, because I know that uh, the nuclear bomb test materials were detected on, on uh, spacecraft that they brought back down to Earth, um, and that was in lower orbital space. So um, it's probably really mixed throughout the whole global atmosphere. It is in one year and higher than the troposphere. So it it will take years and years and years for it to completely rain out but 95 percent will rain out in two and a half months and that's what we need to be worried about we'll be back in just a moment with loren moray are back with Lauren Moray. Lauren, you believe that Fukushima was done on purpose as well as many other false flag operations that have been carried out by the U.S. government in the last decade. In fact, you made an interesting observation that the USS Ronald Reagan was parked off Japan's coast on standby at the time of the Japan earthquake. And you observed this at the time of other false flag events as well? Yeah, um, Hurricane Katrina, Haiti, there's always a Navy ship sitting there, the uh, Sumatra earthquake and tsunami. Uh, the U.S. Navy's always there because HARP is their weapon. They're actually in charge of HARP and in space, although uh, the Air Force is sort of a cover story. Um, I knew when I read or I saw on the Internet that the USS Ronald Reagan was offshore uh, because when I travel, and I've been on 20 speaking tours in Japan since the year 2000, um, people tell me a lot, and it's, it's things that um, the Japanese are very, very aware. They're very, very informed and well-educated, and um, they pay attention to uh, not just what's in the newspaper, but what, not, what is not in the newspaper. And what they told me is that their prime minister, named Nakasone, who was a Japanese Navy uh, captain or, or admiral, actually went to Washington, D.C. and made a secret agreement with Ronald Reagan when he was president to import MOX fuel to Japan to put in the reactors. And, um, of course, MOX fuel is very unstable. It's uh, very, very controversial. It's not a safe 
fuel to use in nuclear power plants because it's not just uranium oxide, it's also plutonium oxide. So you're mixing uranium and plutonium, and, and the plutonium has, um, it's much more uh, radioactive. It has a shorter half-life. So you introduce instability into the nuclear reactors, which you don't want that there. Uh-huh. And, um, and so, um, so when the, the Ronald Reagan was offshore, I knew this event involved MOX fuel. And sure enough, Reactor 3, uh, although in 2002, the governor of that prefecture, Fukushima prefecture, outlawed MOX fuel in his prefecture. And governors in Japan of prefectures have more authority than the federal government in their own uh, governing areas. So he was able to outlaw it, and actually a General Electric uh, power plant inspector friend of mine, his name is Kei Sugaoka, he's Japanese-American. He's the one who went to the governor with all his documentation and said they're doing this, the governor went on TV with him and not only prohibited MOX fuel, he shut down all of TEPCO, all of their reactors for months. It must have cost billions of dollars. And um, so the, um, so the, uh, so Kay had told me, you know, about the MOX fuel. And then I read, then I began doing uh, reading and tracking everything. And it's so wonderful to have the Internet because it's right at your fingertips, any answer that you want about anything. And I, sure enough, the Israelis were changing the security system in September of 2010, right before Fukushima happened, and that's also when the Stuxnet virus was introduced to the operating system of the Fukushima plant. And um, I did research with a friend of mine in Texas, and we were able to, um, she had a friend who worked for Siemens, a German company that makes the controllers for nuclear power plants. And we are back for the last segment of Nuked Radio today. Lauren, when we were um, having some of our technical difficulties, I was filling some time in with the listeners talking about your research you did in mapping diseases where you actually traced back to 1898 in Japan and proved that diseases like autism and diabetes rise dramatically at the start of rainy seasons, and this is especially noted since the introduction of nuclear weapons. That's right, and um, <clears throat> I'm a geoscientist. I'm not a, a medical person, but I saw a global map of diabetes in the New York Times, and I was flabbergasted, and I've been following and pursuing this line of evidence ever since, and what that map showed me was that the um, highest diabetes rates in the world, this is mortality from diabetes, were um, at the same latitude in the northern hemisphere, like a rubber band around the planet, and the southern hemisphere. Um, in other words, in the same latitude of the nuclear bomb tests in the no- northern and southern uh, latitudes, <coughs> I'm sorry, hemispheres, and what that told me right away is that the um, the jet stream was just with the main distributor for the nuclear bomb test material, and um, also you could just see the the tip of <clears throat> South America and the tip of Africa um, with high, elevated diabetes mortality rates, um, and Africa actually had the lowest diabetes rates in the world, and. Uh, So then I said, well, how come the blacks in the United States, African-American communities have the highest diabetes rates in the U.S. and maybe in the world? And uh, then I I started investigating their food and dairy products and 
government food and um uh, I work with a, a group of scientists, very good scientists, and we were able to prove that um, the U.S. government, it's U.S. national policy to ship the most radioactive milk in the United States directly from dairies around nuclear power plants into poor and uh, minority inner city communities into the mom and pop stores so the u.s government is deliberately nuking the poor and minorities in the united states with contaminated dairy products and food well and, it, and it's not just the air and the contamination and food you had also published a research paper with data from an indian scientist showing 25 million babies died in india from the Sellafield disaster the rat <laughs> yes. migrated by way of the great conveyor belt and now the same things happening to the pacific where will this contamination travel to after the pacific the same place the same place the the um Sellafield uh, radiation went. Um, the great conveyor belt is where it's basically the heat sink for the world. It controls the global climate. And it's a huge current that travels. Uh, it could travel five miles an hour and it loops down through the Atlantic. Uh, it goes through Southeast Asia between Australia and the China mainland, or I should say Malaysia and Vietnam and those countries. And then it loops up around the Pacific, up around uh, Alaska, and it comes back through uh, Southeast Asia and up the Atlantic. So basically it's contaminating all of the oceans, the poles, and every continent from that, that current. It ends up washing up on the shorelines. And um, the, uh, the Sellafield... Uh, dumping, the deliberate dumping of huge amounts of, of radioactive materials into the Irish Sea from the Sellafield reprocessing plant near Wales in England, the western part of England, um, was actually the practice run or the foreshadowing or the demo for Fukushima. And that was the that was the British government that did that. And from my research and what I've been saying in interviews, it's really the British who uh, caused Fukushima. Even with everything that you know about Fukushima, are you surprised at all by any of the numbers that are coming out about the actual contamination? I'm I'm beyond horrified. However, I work with a Manhattan Project scientist. He's one of the last living scientists who worked on the Manhattan Project in World War II. He's 93, and he was an undergraduate then at the University of Chicago. And when I went to his house and brought the news to him that he won't get on television, and I, I brought all my data and, and the investigation I'd done, he just sat there. He just didn't say anything. He And then I kept going back and taking him more of uh, the numbers and the levels they were measuring and everything. And he just said, I knew this was going to happen. Uh -huh. the USGS. Not, not that he knew not that the event would happen, but he knew what the consequences were. Yeah. The USGS had just released some figures of contamination levels in L.A. and in Portland, but the data is only through April 5th of 2011. You know, based on just those those preliminary findings, do we need to undergo a full-scale decontamination in the United States, in your opinion? Well, the, um, Japan, all of Japan, the uh, Pacific Islands like Midway and Guam and, and Hawaii, and the Pacific Coast of North America absolutely need to be evacuated. Uh -huh. Absolutely. This is more than 300 times 300 Chernobyls. Yeah. And you found that dose rates have been extensively studied by the U.S. government in places like Gaza. So our government is well aware of the effects that Fukushima will have on the population. Are you kidding? They're over there sampling every atom. They know exactly what's going to happen. They have had bomb testing studies, 
nuclear power plant studies, nuclear power plant workers, um, the um, depleted uranium, and they've been using fourth generation nuclear weapons in Iraq and, and Lebanon and, and Yugoslavia. They know and Afghanistan, they know exactly what's happening. They're measuring every atom of radiation blowing off the Himalayas. They certainly know what's coming from Japan. I worked at the Livermore Nuclear Weapons Lab, and black helicopters flew into the lab every single day with samples they'd taken out in the Pacific. They know. Yesterday on the show, we talked about how much cancer rates have gone up since the 1940s, and it's now one in three or, or approximately 38 percent, but that's actually before Fukushima. How fast do you think we're going to start seeing some of these cancers happening? Oh, well, already. Uh, the, the worst thing is it's not the cancer. It's all the other diseases that radiation causes. Cancer has the, is the, the least common disease. Um, what I'm seeing is athletes in England, in the United States, in Texas, in Pittsburgh, uh, athletes who, for instance, are doing running races, uh, uh, very ultra long distance races. Um, these people are dropping dead, just dropping dead in the middle of the race. That's the cesium attaching to the heart and killing enough cells in the heart for the heart to have a heart attack, or it's called cardiac arrest. And these athletes, young athletes in their 30s and 20s, are just dropping dead in the middle of the races or at the finish line. That's it. That's it. That's Fukushima. 100,000 Americans had died by Christmas from Fukushima. You, you've said multiple times, and I, and I think that uh, it's always worth repeating, and if it wasn't clear to you before, it probably is after the show. Help is not going to come from the government. We need to take charge of our own health and share solutions with each other. And I don't know if you and people like Chris Busby know that you have an army of followers that want to help in any way that we possibly can. What can we do to help get your word out? Number one is to be informed and to get information from good sources. Most of the sites like e, &E News, Arne Gunderson, um, Amy Goodman, all of these people are part of the, uh, the establishment or funded by the establishment or controlled by it. So they are going to have limited hangout. There are scientists like Busby and like me and, and uh, uh, Major Doug Rocky, and there are lots of people who uh, are actually telling the truth and exposing what's really happening. Um, and so people need to um, go to good sources, and then uh, they need to share the information with everyone they know, and we need to have lots of people like you, radio programs, where people can listen and then discuss it with neighbors and family members and friends. Lauren, thank you so much for coming on the show today and sharing your knowledge. We've only just scratched the surface of what this lady knows and the, the many topics that your lectures and, and interviews have covered are, are pretty much all uploaded to YouTube. I'm going to start a playlist today with just her stuff. And I encourage everyone to, to listen to everything this lady is saying. Thank you so much, Loren, for being on. And I'm sorry about all the difficulties, but we, uh, we went out in the long run. <laughs> Every day is an adventure. And this Fukushima disaster is a way for the global population to transform to something much better.